Welcome good people, my name is Joel Collier and today we're going to talk about what is reliability from a social science perspective. We'll look at the different kind of types of reliability, uh, why we have different types, and I'll briefly go over how to calculate reliability uh, in kind of a quick and easy format. Uh, and I'll do so, though, do so in kind of SBSS and I'll also use a structural equation modeling program to kind of show you as well. So first and foremost, let's figure out, so how, what is reliability and is it the same thing as validity? Um, well, what is reliability? Reliability is nothing more than just really consistency. Uh, is it repeatable? Uh, so when you say reliability, what you're really saying is, is are your results consistent? So let's say you, that you actually uh, step on a scale. And the first time you step on it, it says uh, you're 200 pounds. And the second time you step on it, it says you're 150 pounds. And the third time, it says 200 pounds. But then the fourth time you step on it, it says 150 pounds. Well, in essence, you have no reliability in that measurement of your weight because there is inconsistency in the measurement there. So if you stepped on it every time and every time it said 200, well, then you would have reliability. You have consistency. There's repeatability in the measurement that is accurate then. So when we're talking about reliability from a social science perspective, it's really understanding the measures that we're using, are they consistent? Now, is that the same thing as are they valid? No, it is not. Um, you can have a scale that is consistently wrong. So it's consistently giving you, you step on the scale and it says you're 330 pounds, even though you're only 150. But it consistently keeps coming up with 330 pounds. Well, it's consistent, it's, you know, it has reliability in its measurement, but that doesn't mean it's valid or it's accurate. And so sometimes there's a really a kind of a misnomer sometimes that, well, I, my, my scales are reliable, you know, my measures are reliable, it's good. Well, that doesn't mean it's really valid, though, and it doesn't mean you're kind of accurately capturing this uh, concept that you're trying to really uh, understand from a social science perspective. So again, reliability and validity are not the same thing. Validity is really more, are you accurately capturing the concept? And reliability is, is, is your measures consistent in its measurement? So the other thing you, we need to kind of talk about here is really the different types of reliability in social science research. Um, the first one is what we call test-retest reliability. Uh, so you see a lot of this um, in psychology, sociology, a lot of business, a lot of consumer behavior. It is where you will test somebody um, and then there will be a, a delay, a time period, whatever it is, and then you retest them again and you see if there's consistency there. The reason why they do that is to show that if there was any bias in that one particular uh, the first test or even the retest that's out there. Sometimes you'll see a test retest um, uh, per, uh, from a lot of uh, education related uh, standpoints too to see if this test is accurately measuring the intelligence or uh, whatever it is of the students. And so again you'll see kind of the, the exact same measure kind of given but over a period of uh, uh, of time so you'll have the test one a period of time and then test two the other type of reliability you'll see a lot of times in social science is what's called inner rater reliability this is where you see this more often used in qualitative research where let's say you had an interview uh, and you're looking for themes in this interview for what people you know why they were disappointed with the movie and so you're looking for themes that kind of came out of it uh, so you may have one person who goes through that interview, we'll call them a coder one. So coder one goes through the interview and they come up with what they think are some of the themes why they were disappointed. And then you'll have an independent, a second one who's independent of the, the first coder and they'll go through it. And then what they'll do is they'll come up with their themes. And if they have consistency in the themes that they keep coming out, then you have what's called inner rater reliability. But if they're very inconsistent in what the themes, then you have very low inter-rater reliability. Um, you, you'll see this 
measured in a you know kind of a lot of different ways some people will just kind of take averages some people will see are they consistency on a percentage basis if you want to get more kind of specific from a quantitative perspective and showing its inter-rater reliability uh, Peralt and Lee has a little index to assess uh, inter-rater reliability it is probably one of the more I guess we'd say well used indexes of inter-rater reliability uh, from that perspective the last type of reliability I'm going to talk about today is called internal consistency and we'll spend the bulk of the time today really going over that and specifically how to, uh, to measure it and test it so when you're talking about internal consistency really what we're talking about is is there's some unobservable concept that is out there that I'm trying to measure um, and I've maybe let's say I've created five survey items to capture this unobservable construct that's out there and so I want to know uh, is there internal consistency within those five survey items that I'm you know consistently measuring the same uh, the same construct there and you'll see this kind of done in two different ways one is what's called Cronbach's alpha sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as coefficient alpha too is a way to calculate um, uh, internal consistency. The other way is what's called composite reliability. Uh, composite reliability is a little different in that it uses uh, kind of results from a confirmatory factor analysis to assess a reliability. Cronbach's alpha is a function that you can use in most statistical programs that will just kind of spit out the results for you and I'll show you how to use that in SPSS uh, too. Before we jump into uh, understanding how to calculate Cronbach's alpha and whatnot, we really need to kind of uh, really understand too. Why do you see usually three survey items for um, for to capture unobservable constructs? Why not one? Why why do I need you know so many if that's the case? And more likely than not, the reason why you see at least three items is so they can assess reliability. If you had a single item measure out there, the assumption is that, that there's no error, like it perfectly measures it, you know, which obviously it isn't the case, especially with hard to kind of capture constructs. It's very unlikely that a single item is going to do so. Well, what if we just had two items? If we have two items, what we're doing is really just assessing the correlation between these two survey items. We're not really assessing its even reliability as much as just its just simple correlation. But if we have at least three items, then what we can do is we can assess the internal consistency between those items. Because now I can independently regress uh, um, instead of just looking at just the correlation between two items. Um, and so what happens is, is they're going to say, well, if you have at least a minimum of three items, then I can kind of determine, determine this internal consistency. Otherwise, I'm either just looking at correlations with two, or I'm just assuming that it's a perfect item with one. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that because people get a lot of questions of like, why do I really need three items? It's really for reliability reasons more than anything that you see. Probably some validity reasons too, uh, but the biggest one is reliability. So the first first one with, uh, with internal consistency is Cronbach's alpha. I would say by far it is the most widely used. Um, it is uh, very prominent out there. What happens is, is Cronbach's alpha is going to determine this internal consistency and it does so um, by kind of putting its value on a zero to one scale. So zero means that it's very inconsistent. One means that it's perfectly consistent across all of those items. So the higher the, the number, the better. Um, well, how high should my Cronbach's alpha be? Um, the kind of unwritten rule, if you will, is that Cronbach's alpha should at least be 0.7 and above. Well, where did that come from? Well, Nunley and Bernstein initially uh, had, had said, hey, anything above 0.7 uh, is really kind of showing uh, acceptable reliability. 
from a complex alpha perspective. Now I will put a little caveat on there. They were really kind of talking about kind of newly formed um, kind of constructs with that too. Not necessarily well-established constructs. Uh, have a well-established construct has been used multiple times, been revised a bunch. You're probably your internal reliability or your Chromebox Alpha specifically should probably be well above 0.70, probably even in the 0.8s really. Um, but especially if it's a new construct, um, you may be still kind of figuring out if you've captured all the pieces from, an from a consistency standpoint. And so usually, again, the bare minimum kind of threshold is that 0.7 and above is considered uh, an acceptable reliability from a Chromebox Alpha. Now, I'll give, I will give you a warning, though. Chromebox Alpha, uh, the value itself, does inflate the larger number of observations or indicators that you have. So, will you see an artificial inflation of your reliability uh, compared to five items versus 15 items, you know, measuring a construct. Yeah, the 15 item ones is going to show, it's going to inflate that uh, Chromebox Alpha a little bit. The downside with Chromebox Alpha too is it assumes um, that all indicators have an equal influence, which oftentimes isn't always the case. Uh, you'll see some that will have probably a little bit more of an influence than others, but Chromebox Alpha actually uh, treats them all equally. Then. So saying that, let's jump into SPSS and I'll give you an example of how to calculate Chromebox Alpha. So what I have here is a data that has already been coded in SPSS and you can see up here at the top I've got looks like an ADAPT1, ADAPT2, ADAPT3, ADAPT4, and ADAPT5. So I had five items that were measuring this construct called adaptive behavior. This came out of a uh, a retail setting where we were trying to understand did the employee adapt their behavior to me. Um, so we ask uh, customers five questions about that. Really their perceptions did the employee adapt their behavior uh, to the customer. So I've coded all of the, the data. It was on a one to seven scale. So now I want to calculate the reliability of my five items. Uh, so once I've got it all coded in there, first place I'm going to go to is Analyze in SPSS. Now SAS is a little bit different if you're using SAS, but the, the premise is pretty much the same, except you just may have, it may look a little different. But I'm going to use kind of SPSS for just consistency purposes here to kind of show you how to do that. So you're going to go up to Analyze and you're going to go to Scale. Uh, and you'll see in the Scale function it'll say Reliability Analysis. All right, so we'll click on that. So in the reliability analysis, uh, it's going to ask you, what are the items you want to check for reliability? So uh, I had initially these adapt 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You'll just highlight those and then just kind of bring them over. And you can see down here, it's going to ask, well, what kind of reliability analysis are you going to want? And the default is Chromebox Alpha. It's the most widely used. It's uh, there as well. From a statistics standpoint, too, there's three items that I like to check in here. Uh, one is item, what is the scale, and then usually scale if item deleted. Now, what that tells us is if I delete one of my five items, will my reliability get any better? So it'll give me kind of an indication that maybe I've got a problematic uh, Chromebox Alpha, but if I drop one of those items, my reliability problems may disappear too. So I like to include that. So let's just, we'll hit OK, and we'll get our results. And so you can see initially it's going to tell you, like, what is the, the total sample uh, in here. And it's, you can see with by cl clicking the item statistics, it gives me the specifics, so the mean for each one of the questions I ask for adaptive behavior, my standard deviation, uh, the total sample for each one of those. Right here you can see my Chromebox Alpha. So my Chromebox Alpha is 0.948. Again, that is well above 0.7, so it is showing very consistent uh, results across those uh, those measures. Down here is the item total statistics if one was deleted. So you can see this last column, it says what would Chromebox Alpha be if you deleted this item? So if I deleted ADAPT1, the first ADAPT item, my Chromebox Alpha would be 0.934, which is actually worse than the original. And you can see in any of these uh, as well, there's really no need to delete any of those items because the Combrex Alpha would actually be worse if we did that. 
So pretty quick and easy way to kind of figure out what is my Cronbach's alpha. Again, the actual value of Cronbach's alpha is up here. And then if you deleted items, this is what the adjusted Cronbach's alpha would be. So pretty straightforward, you know, from that perspective. So that's the uh, Cronbach's alpha. How do I calculate composite reliability? So there's a, a pretty wide variety of um, research out there that says composite reliability is probably more of an accurate representation of internal consistency than even Cronbach's alpha. And the reason why is because it comes from a confirmatory factor analysis too. Well, how do I calculate composite reliability? Well, I've got the formula right here. It's the sum of standardized loadings from a confirmatory factor analysis divided, squared divided by the sum of standardized factor loading squared plus the sum of indicator measurement error. Now, if you saw that just like I did the very first time, I was like, what? What does that mean? That's kind of convoluted. What do you mean? So let's look at an example uh, of how to actually calculate this. It's not that complicated once you break it down into its pieces. So I've jumped over here into uh, SPSS Amos and I've set up a simple confirmatory factor analysis. It's got my adaptive behavior here and my five items that are out there too. I actually had two other constructs that I was looking at. One was customer delight and the other one was word of mouth. How much did positive word of mouth did they spread? after their experience. But once I run this analysis uh, in uh, SP, I mean uh, in Amos, it'll give me what's called the uh, unstandardized factor loadings for all of these. Uh, and that's not going to really help us when you're talking about com uh, composite reliability. What we need is called the standardized regression weights or the standardized factor loadings. So for their adaptive behavior one, two, three, and four, here are the standardized factor loadings. Standardized factor loadings, real quickly, is on a zero to one scale. It kind of uh, standardizes uh, all of your results from that zero to one to, for comparison purposes. Uh, and usually you want to see um, uh, what you would say very accurate items in a standardized factor loading being uh, greater than 0 0.70. So kind of consistent with that same kind of criteria for reliability, but this is really different. It's standardized factor loadings, but um, but it has a kind of a 0.7 and above kind of criteria too. So we're going to basically take all of these standardized factor loadings that we got from our CFA, and then we're going to plug them into our formula then. All right, so let's go do that. So I've got... Um, all those standardized factor loadings and they're listed right here uh, out there and so now what we're going to do is we're going to take those standardized factor loadings for adaptive behavior one through five and we're going to plug them into our formula so initially uh, on the very top of our um, our formula here we're going to take all of the standardized factor loadings and we're going to sum them all up and then we're going to square it you know so pretty straightforward from that the bottom half of the uh, formula is going to have the same uh, initially the same uh, sum of standardized uh, factor loadings if you will at the bottom so everything's going to be exactly the same except now we're also going to add the indicators measurement error well how do I get measurement error per indicator what you're going to do is you're going to take one minus the um, what's called the uh, sum of squares or the squared multiple correlation for each indicator. So each one of these standardized factor loadings, like for instance, let's take this first one of ADAPT1 right here, has a 0.896. That's its standardized factor loading. If I square that value right there, that will get me my squared multiple correlation value. In essence, how much of the variance am I explaining? So if I want to find out what is the error, I'm going to take 1 minus that squared multiple correlation to determine how much I'm not explaining, if you will. When I'm not explaining, well, that's error then. So again, just to recap, you're going to take that standardized regression weight, and if you square it, that gets you your squared multiple correlation, or the value that you're explaining. And if you want to know the error, you take 1 minus that squared multiple correlation to tell you what you're not explaining, or error. 
So we're going to take that 1 minus the square value of that standardized factor loading for each one of these. Um, and then we're just going to put it into that simple formula after that and it will give us what is our reliability uh, that's out there. Will you see a wide uh, difference between uh, Chromebox Alpha and composite reliability? No. Uh, you probably won't see that huge of a difference between the two. Will I see some differences? Yeah, you'll probably see slight differences between the two. You're not going to see, you know, huge, uh, probably swings in reliability across the two. But if you're talking about what's probably the more accurate, uh, probably composite reliability. There's way more steps to it to actually do that. Chromebox Alpha is easy. It's pretty straightforward. I can do that in a matter of, you know, minutes, where Chromebox Alpha takes a little bit more time and effort to do so. Um, so that's kind of the downside of it. So that's kind of the overview of reliability. Uh, we talked about test, retest, iterator, and then some internal consistency and in how you actually calculate those too. So if you're looking for more information about uh, reliability or even just social science, you know, data collection, specifically in structural equation modeling, uh, I'd encourage you to check out my book, Applied Structural Equation Modeling Using uh, Amos. Uh, and as always, um, I hope you all have a great week. Good people.